Okay, welcome to our second <clears throat> radioactivity lecture. This one's going to be on radiometric dating and nuclear power. So, first, a question from the last lecture. Why does an atom like uranium have far more neutrons than protons in the nucleus? So, we looked at that, and we saw that protons have a repulsive electric force, but an attractive nuclear force, whereas neutrons only have an attractive nuclear force and that nuclear force is attracted between protons and neutrons as well as neutrons and neutrons. So if you have more protons, you have more repulsive force, which means you have to do something to mitigate the increasing repulsive force. The attractive force is only nearest neighbor, and so you have to move those repulsive things farther apart to weaken their force. So as you get... <laughs> I'm looking at some of these kind of funny. Um, it's not about angular momentum states. Um, you need more neutrons to counter the electrostatic repulsion of the protons because the neutrons are an attractive, they, they are participating in attractive force, attracting protons to neutrons and neutrons to neutrons. And they push apart the protons. So the protons are going to have a weaker repulsive force. Back to the uranium decay sequence, um, just re-putting it in here so you can see the full diagram instead of having it truncated. So you see the uranium-238 going to thorium with a half-life of four and a half billion years. Now that we've talked about half-life, it makes more sense what's going on there. So if I start with a sample of uranium-238, and I have one half as much uranium-238 as I started with, then I would say, ah, because I have one half of what I started with, I'm now four and a half billion years old. Well, if I wait four and a half billion years, how much am I going to have of these other elements? Well, the thorium, only 24 days for it to decay into protactinium, but the protactinium only 6.7 hours into uranium-234. Uranium-234 takes 250,000 years, but to Compared to four and a half billion years, that's a blink of an eye. Then that create, decays into thorium-230, which is only 75,000 years for its half-life to decay into radium-226. 1,600 years for that to decay into radon-222. Radon-222 takes only 3.8 days to go to polonium-218. Now, notice the polonium-218, it can decay one of two ways. It could have either a beta decay to become actinium or it can have a, an alpha decay to become lead-214. Now, if you look at the times, it's 3.1 minutes for it to decay um, to actinium. And yeah, it's, it's also 3.1 minutes to decay into lead-214. So it's about the same. Um, and sometimes those are not the same. In this picture, it looks like they're always the same when it has the two pathways. Anyway, yeah, it's not necessarily the case. I think there might be a mistake actually in this picture. Usually one is dominant. You know, for instance, um, I was teaching a class where we were doing um, potassium. Um, oh, boy. My brain's gone completely... Um, potassium argon dating and the the decay is like 10 percent in the way that we analyze and 90 percent the other way anyway so you have different pathways it can take but these times down here are all very very short compared to the starting one and you end up at lead 206 so uranium 238 after four and a half billion years, you'll have half the amount of lead 238 you started with, and virtually all of the other half is going to be, of uranium 238, is going to be lead 206. And so you can determine how old something is just by using that relationship. N is equal to N0 
b to the minus lambda t. So if you measure how much lead 206 you have, you can say my n0 is equal to the n of lead 206 plus the n of uranium 238. We can say, okay, that should be how much we started with. And so I'm just going to, I'm, So we should be able to just plug that in and get a date. Pretty simple, right? Well, except what if some is lost? For instance, the polonium along the way, or not polonium, the radi radon along the way is a gas. And that gas could have escaped. And so we might not have as much lead as we expect because some of the lead is somewhere else. It, it escaped from my rock. And so the initial condition, knowing what you started with, is kind of a trick for radiometric dating. Now, in, before I go into radiometric dating, I know that was totally a lead-in. I'm going to talk about nuclear power first. So you can't talk about nuclear power without talking about Enrico Fermi. And it might be considered uh, insensitive to use the word godfather here. I don't know, but that's, I, that's a name for him. So Enrico Fermi was kind of a unicorn because he was both an experimentalist, which is what my training is, and a theorist, which is not what my training is. In physics, we have people who are theorists, people who study the laws of physics and come up with a theory, which is essentially what you're studying here in class. And they have people who are experimentalists who test things. And he did both. And so he had a lot of theoretical contributions, but he also was the person who made the first, quote, nuclear pile, which is essentially the first nuclear reactor. He made it under a racquetball court at University of Chicago. And pretty soon they realized this isn't very safe. And so they, they moved things out to New Mexico where nobody lived and nobody wanted to live, except for apparently my, my grand great-grandparents who tried to homestead in, in Elida. Anyway, um, so he got a Nobel Prize for his work in 238, which is actually before the development of nuclear bomb. So nuclear power and nuclear bombs is the same physics. So what we're talking about here applies to both. And the key to nuclear power is two things. We talked about the equation in the last lecture E equals mc squared, and when a nucleus is stable, then it's going to have um, a different mass than if it's unstable. And, and so protons have different masses depending on what nucleus they're in. So that's the key to this is energy is released, and we can measure it in terms of mass defect, the change in mass. Now, for nuclear power... For a nuclear fission power, to be specific, we have something like this. You take uranium-235, remember that was 0.7% of naturally occurring uranium, and if a neutron interacts with that uranium-235, it can be momentarily absorbed. This star means it's unstable. It can be momentarily absorbed. Now, what's the probability of it being absorbed? Here's a graph that shows what we call the neutron cross-section. Cross the cross-section is probability of being absorbed. And you're totally going to laugh at this, but the unit for the probability of being absorbed is a barn, as in you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And they break barns into smaller <laughs> smaller units, and they don't call them milli barns. They call them sheds, okay? Because scientists, we think we're funny, funny folk. Well, here's the thing. The probability is much, much higher if you have a slow-moving neutron 
than if you have a high moving neutron. The high moving neutron is simply not going to be around long enough for there to be any chance of an interaction. So you need slow moving neutrons. We call slow moving neutrons thermal. In thermal equilibrium. Which, which means that it has a speed, an RMS speed, that's similar to the RMS speed you would have for that temperature. So remember, the RMS, I don't remember the equation. I think it was something like that. And so the RMS speed is commensurate with the temperature of the rest of your sample. That's what we call a thermal neutron. So you have to have a thermal neutron in order for there to be a reasonable cross-section, a reasonable chance of that neutron being absorbed. The faster it's going, for the most part, the less likely it is to be absorbed. So you absorb this, you become this highly unstable uranium-236, which breaks into nucleus-1 and nucleus-2. This is just an example of nucleus-1 and nucleus-2. It is not the defining values. In fact, this graph here shows you the probabilities um, from 65% uranium and 35% plutonium. Great, we, we mixed them. Um, but you see that it's not just going to be one, it's going to be a lot of different options that it breaks into. And so this is an example. Now these neutrons here are not thermal neutrons. They're going to be in this energy range. And so these are, quote, hot or fast neutrons. Now, how is this release energy? Well, it has to do with mass. Um, I'm actually going to add a slide here so we have some room to do some work. I want to give us a, whoa, page manipulation. Insert, there we go. Want to do a little math. So first, let's just put down the masses of everything involved. Mass of, I'm just going to put U-235. So the mass of uranium-235 is, and I looked all of these up before. So uranium-235 has, oh, come on, scroll. Has a mass of... 235.04393301 atomic mass units. So that's my first thing. The mass of the neutron is equal to, and it's on my next slide. I'm going to have to just come down here. Well, not the next slides in here. The mass of the neutron is 1.008665. And then the mass of barium-141, which is not naturally occurring, it's not listed in most tables because it just doesn't exist in nature, is, and I have it on the screen here, there's 140.9144-1109 atomic mass units. And the mass of krypton 92 is 91.926173094 atomic mass units. So those are the masses of everything in that equation. Now, if we take the mass of the parents, that's going to be the mass of uranium-235 plus the mass of a neutron. So that's just adding those two numbers up. And of course... <laughs> I am going to use a calculator for this. Actually, I should use a spreadsheet, right? I should have made the spreadsheet beforehand. It would have been the wise move. But no, I didn't think of that. I just got my numbers and said, I'll do the work in class. So uranium is 235.03 235 
the neutron is 1.008665, the barium is 140.9144.1109, and krypton is 91.92617309.4. So if we add these up, then the mass of the parents equals the 235 point whatever plus, and you've got to keep all the digits here. You can't truncate things or you'll get numbers that are just way off. So the mass of the parents is 236.0525951 atomic mass units. The mass of the daughters, these things here are the daughter products. These things here are the parent products. That's going to be the mass of barium plus the mass of the krypton plus the mass of three neutrons. And so that gives you 235.8665792 atomic mass units. Now, we had the same number of protons, right? Add them up. 92 here, 56 plus 36 is 92 there. We have the same number of total things in the nucleus. Once again, add them up. 236, let's just do it. Z for the parent is equal to 92. Z for the 92 plus zero. For the daughter is equal to 56 plus 36 plus zero, plus three times zero if you want to be accurate, although what's the point, is 92. <clears throat> the atomic mass for the parents is equal to 235 plus one equals 236. The atomic mass for the daughter is equal to 141 plus 92 plus three times one equals, and once again, um, 92 and three is 95. 95 and 141 is 236. Wow, I, my third, 236 didn't look right there. So we have the same number of protons, the same number of nucleons, the same constituents exactly, but the masses are different. And the mass released, what we call the disintegration energy, is equal to the mass of the parent minus the mass of the daughter multiplied by the speed of light squared. So that would be 236.0525951 atomic mass units minus 235.8665792 atomic mass units, all multiplied by C squared. Now, if you do your math there, you end up with a mass defect, what we call it, of 236.1525, Minus 235, oh, keyboard, I've got some problems. It's my Logitech mouse, if you want, or Logitech wireless keyboard that is causing my problems. So that's a mass defect of 0.1860125. Now, in this case, I actually didn't need to keep a lot of digits because, you know, I've got a bunch of them up here. But that, atomic mass units times C squared. Well, now we need, to we need to get this into standard units. Remember, kilogram is the standard unit for mass. So I could use kilograms, or I can come right down to, once again, the same thing. One atomic mass unit is equal to... 1.660539 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, or make that 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Or we can go straight to energy, 931.4941 MeV per C squared. 
931.49. So let's get my <laughs> I'm typing in the wrong keyboard this time. It's not, it's not the computer's fault. I'm gonna scroll back down so I don't get that number confused. Four nine four one MEV per C squared. Now notice my C squares are going to cancel here. Oh, I forgot to put U. My U's cancel there. And I'm left with 173.27 MeV mega electron volts is released from this one fission event. So that's a lot of energy that's released in the form of this mass defect. The, the mass of the daughter products is less and so you converted energy into mass and you release that energy. Now I've done this whole calculation. Why must neutrons be thermal to produce a nuclear fission chain reaction? I have to give you actually background for this. Um, when I was in college, I took all of my education classes during the summer because I wanted to you know, be a teacher. And so in uh, one of our curriculum instruction classes, a guy did his his presentation on nuclear fission and he didn't mention thermal neutrons and i was just a smart aleck when he's all done and it's question time i said now the textbook says that those have to be thermal neutrons why what does it mean to be a thermal neutron why do they have to be thermal neutrons and he was just because uh, <laughs> he didn't know well it's an important thing they have to be thermal which means slow moving so they're in thermal equilibrium with their environment because the nuclear cross section, the probability of them being absorbed is much higher when they're thermal, when they're slowed down. So not fast, but slow. <laughs> Electrically neutral neutrons. Yeah, because the charged neutrons. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So back to this, um, Rutherford determined the size of a nucleus. We've already looked at this, but here's an actual calculation. Nuclei are essentially um, close packed spheres. And so they form a sphere with a radius that's about 1.2 femtometers. A femtometer, femtometer means 10 to the minus 15th meters. And it's also called a Fermi for Enrico Fermi because it's useful in nuclear physics. So if I have uranium-235, well, 238, let's, well, 235, we're, into, we're in a nuclear fission now, so uranium-235, then I have a total of 235 things in the nucleus. And so the radius of uranium-235 would be 1.2 femtometers times 235 to the one-third power. And so, you just put that in your calculator and you have 1.2 times 235 raised to the and you have equals 7.4 femtometers. So that's the size of a nucleus of uranium. Whereas if it was hydrogen, it would have been 1.2. So the uranium nucleus with 235 more particles than the hydrogen is about six times bigger in diameter. Gives you a good idea for the scale of nuclei. The nuclei are all small. <clears throat> this here, the calculation that we just did for the energy released in nuclear fission, it can be done for any radioactive decay. The energy released, like I said, we usually call that Q, the disintegration energy, is the mass of the parent minus the mass of the daughter times C squared. That is, we're taking Einstein's equation saying 
energy parent is equal to mass of the parent c squared. Energy of the daughter is equal to mass of the daughter c squared. And Q is equal to the energy of the parent minus the energy of the daughter. That's how much energy is released. <clears throat> so you can take an example of something that undergoes an alpha decay, and you can calculate how much energy you're going to have released, which is almost exclusively going to be in kinetic energy of that particle. So for instance, I could take uranium-238 decays into thorium-230 plus the alpha particle. And remember that thorium, thorium is going to be 2 plus, or 2 minus, no, 2 plus, 2 plus is correct. 2 plus because it has two more protons but no extra electrons, and the alpha is a 2 minus. Now if I take these masses, I have to keep track of the electrons. But because I have the 2 plus here and the 2 minus, that is mathematically equivalent to a neutral uranium-92-230 plus a neutral helium-24. Right? Because this is quickly going to gain two electrons, that's quickly going to lose two electrons. And so when we do the math on this, we just say, okay, that's equal to the mass of the parent. So the mass of uranium-238, which once again, I do have that chart open. The mass of uranium-238 is 92, 238, 238. 0 0.050784 and the mass of the th um <laughs> this should have been thorium oh my goodness i made all kinds of mistakes i don't know where my brain was the mass of the thorium-234 is it's not on my table because it's not commonly occurring. So I have to look that up. Thorium-234. <sighs> Come on. Mass of thorium-234, excellent. Wikipedia is not going to come through for me on this one. Is 234.0436, like those sig figs, don't you? But that's only part then we have the helium, and remember it's actually an alpha particle, but we switch the charge from the thorium two plus um, and he, the alpha two minus, uh, no, thorium, yes, that's right. No, it was the thorium two minus alpha two plus, and that's, okay. So if we put that in our calculator, which in my case is going to be in my spreadsheet, so the mass defect is equal to Got to not drop too many digits here. So that's equal to 0 0.00485146. And obviously, there are some unit issues to be worked out times 931.4941 MEV per mu C squared or UC squared times C squared. 
and you calculate that all out and you get four point two seven one MeV is released for that uranium two thirty eight decaying into thorium two thirty four. That's a fair amount of energy for each single decay. Now it's small compared to the energy that was released um, from the fission, but that's a pretty big amount of energy. So here's the key for doing these kind of calculations. We have the mass of a proton, a neutron, and an electron here. And I put them in kilograms, atomic mass units, and MeV per C squared. Because nuclei are generally listed in atomic mass units, I always look that up. And then I always use the conversion that one atomic mass unit is 931.4941 MeV per C squared. And then the energy released is just mass of the parent minus mass of the daughter times C squared. We've already done two examples of this. Um, you have this table from your textbook with atomic masses as well as decay modes and half-lives that you can use. The table isn't complete, so if you want to go to the National Institute of Standards, you can get a complete table of our best known. I already did the calculation. I repeated this so we can go through the calculation. But what we determined was the disintegration energy is equal to 173.3 MeV, which means we're going to have roughly one third of that in each of the neutrons. Obviously, it's not equally split, but it's going to be roughly that. They're going to be very high energy neutrons, and then we're going to have to slow them down to get down to an energy that can be absorbed. And so notice here, actually, in this table, it tells you this energy. It doesn't say energy. Well, it does say it's in MeVs. And we need that energy to be somewhere out in this ballpark, ideally. And so we're going to have to slow them down a lot if we want those to participate in another reaction. So a key, well, a key for a nuclear reactor is you need to have these slow down so they can go and make more reactions. And I'll talk about this, about the chain reaction, in just a moment. But before I get to that, nuclear stability helps us to understand fission versus fusion. If you take the masses of each element, so we just looked up the masses of a number of different elements. You take those masses and then you um, convert the mass into its rest energy using E equals mc squared. And then you divide by the number of nucleons. That tells you the energy per nucleon. And so the energy per nucleon is highest here for iron and nickel. Translation, iron and nickel are the most stable nuclei. So fission occurs by taking something here that has, you know, say, let's say eight um, MeV per nucleon and making it decay into two things that have around 8.7 MeV per nucleon. And then the energy released is the difference in those. So 9 minus 8.7 would be about 0.3 MeV per nucleon multiplied by 235 nucleons. You can see how that gives you a lot of energy. But fusion is the opposite of fission. So fission is going this way with the most efficient fission ending there at iron and nickel. Fusion is taking small things and adding them up to get closer to iron. And so notice hydrogen 2 is shown because it has a proton and neutron. Hydrogen itself is not shown because there is no binding energy. You can't define binding energy when you only have one thing in the nucleus. But if you could take four hydrogen and combine them to get helium, you would go from zero to about seven point, well, let's say about seven. So that means you're getting about seven electron volts per nucleon released, as opposed to about 0.3 electron volts per nucleon in, um, 0.3, actually, 
that's about seven to eight point seven. That's one point seven. Um, but you're getting a huge amount of more mass or energy per nucleon that's being converted. So there's a lot more energy potential for fusion than there is for fission. Um, boy, I don't know why. I did not mean to ask that a second time. Wow, is that all I have? That is all I have. Well, let me talk about a nuclear reactor and a nuclear bomb here. I'm just going to stay right here and talk about this. So to make a nuclear bomb, you have to start with a fuel, uranium-235. Now that uranium-235 is naturally going to be undergoing random decays. And so it's going to randomly be producing um, um, particles. And if a neutron goes on to cause another reaction, then you would have a chain reaction. So if this was the only equation, we have three neutrons available from every reaction. So that means for every reaction, we could have three more reactions. Well, if you think about that, if the reactions occur, like let's see, they say there's 100 nanoseconds or, you know, one, um, one ten millionth of a second between them, one mil. Yeah. Between the reactions and you have one reaction and then 10 millionths of a second later, you have three reactions. And then 10 millionths of a second later, you have three times three is nine reactions. You can see that's going to grow really rapidly. We call that a chain reaction. And it has a multiplication factor of three because you have three for every one that occurred. Now, we have the same type of thing going on right now with the coronavirus. We have one person that gets infected with the coronavirus and then they go on to pass that on to i think the number is somewhere around five people and so in a matter of a week they infect five people so you had one person and a week later you have five people a week later you have 25 people a week later you have 125 people and that's why the number of coronavirus cases has grown exponentially because for every one person, you have multiple people they infect. And that's why we have implemented these social distancing things. That's why you're not seeing me in class today is because we are trying to separate ourselves so we can lower this multiplication factor. If we can get that multiplication factor down to one, then we're what we call critical. Critical means that the, the rate of infections is going to stay constant. Super critical, you have each infection causes more than one more infection. Subcritical, it's declining. So the difference between a nuclear reactor and a nuclear bomb is a nuclear reactor, you don't want the reaction rate to be increasing. You want to stay constant. And so they have to do something to make that multiplication exactly equal to one, which we call critical, for a nuclear reactor. Well, let's start with the basics. In this equation, we saw that we're releasing 173 mega electron volts. And so each one of those neutrons has to be slowed way down so that it can participate in another reaction. So in a, in a nuclear reactor, you need to have something to slow down the particles. So we call that a, a moderator. So a nuclear reactor, you start with the fuel. The fuel comes in rods. So your reactor has the fuel rods here. And then we have to have a moderator to slow down neutrons so they can participate in another reaction. So they fill this up with water. So water is the moderator.
Okay, so now we've slowed down the neutrons. Well, if you slow down all those neutrons, you have a multiplication factor that's like three. Well, that's a bomb. <laughs> we don't want a bomb. So next we have to have control rods. They absorb neutrons. So the control rods are typically lowered or raised. If you lower them, they're going to absorb a lot of neutrons and you're going to go subcritical. If you pull them all the way out, you don't absorb any neutrons and you're supercritical, that's bomb. And so by how much they're raised or lowered, they can control the rate of reaction. So that's, that's how you design a nuclear reactor. What do you do then to get power out of this? Because we want power. Well, this water is going to be hot and you pipe heat exchange system. to a boiler. And so you pump water through here, it gets heated by the reactor, it boils, and then you use steam power. So a nuclear power plant is actually generating steam power. You're just heating that water to make steam. And notice that water that you're heating is not the water that's the moderator. It's a different water you're using pipes here that are shielded, so you shouldn't have radioactive water. That water in the form of steam is then released ultimately, and it's non-radioactive because it was never allowed to absorb radiation. So nuclear power plants are actually really safe. The amount of radiation you get by being close to a nuclear power plant is much smaller than the amount you get if you're close to a coal power plant. Why? Because coal has a lot of naturally occurring radioactive materials in it, and they burn that coal and re release that to the atmosphere. So the nuclear power plant is fundamentally safer than the coal power plant in terms of radiation, um, unless something goes wrong, i.e. Chernobyl. Now, what about a bomb? The whole point of the bomb is to have supercritical you want F to be as big as possible. And so to make a bomb, if you have a sample of uranium-235, if you have enough of it, if you have a big sample, there's enough of it that if you have a decay here and the neutrons go off, they're going to slow down by colliding with other nuclei until they slow down enough that by the time they get here, they'll absorb and cause another reaction. And so we call this a critical mass when the mass is large enough that collisions between the neutrons released and other nuclei slow them down enough that they then cause a further reaction. So if you have a small piece of uranium, pure uranium-235, it doesn't go boom because the neutrons are just cruising away. But if you have a big piece, it does go boom. So this is subcritical mass. And that's, quote, safe. It's not going to explode. And this is a, if it's above critical, then it's supercritical. So anything bigger than critical, supercritical. Boom. So to make the simplest nuclear bomb, you just have... Here's one piece of maybe three quarters critical mass. And here's another piece of maybe three quarters critical mass. <clears throat> and you have something separating them so neutrons can't pass between them. And then when you want to make a bomb, you take away the separation and you use an explosive to make them smash into each other, and now you have one and a half critical masses. And it goes boom. Pretty simple design. 
Now, if you want a better yield, you have much more complicated designs. But making a nuclear bomb itself is not difficult. You just have to have two subcritical masses that you have a way to combine them on your demand to make a supercritical mass. But notice 235. This is all uranium-235 that I've been talking about. But uranium-235 is only 0.7% of the uranium. Well, I happened to, when I was in graduate school, work up at Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratory in Richland, Washington, which is actually where they made enriched uranium. Enriched uranium means that you have maybe 85% uranium-235. How they did that was they made uranium hexasulfide. Was it sulfide? Yeah, I think so. Um, which is kind of liquidish. And then they put them in centrifuges. And you put them in centrifuges, since uranium-235 has less mass, but is chemically equivalent to uranium-238, the uranium hexasulfide on the inside is going to be uranium-235 primarily, on the outside uranium-238, and so they just separate, and now they have enriched. So when you read about enriched uranium, that's what it is. It has more uranium-235, the stuff that's usable for nuclear bombs. And weapons-grade uranium and reactor-grade uranium are fundamentally the same. Now, you can also make nuclear reactors or nuclear bombs using plutonium. Plutonium does not occur naturally. Plutonium is made by taking uranium-238 and bombarding it with neutrons to create along the way. There's a couple steps along the way until you get to plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 also works for nuclear bombs or power plants. And so in Tennessee, in Oak Ridge um, National Laboratory, that's where they produce the plutonium for nuclear bombs. So we dropped two nuclear bombs in Japan, one on Hiroshima, one in Nagasaki. If I remember right, the one on Hiroshima was a uranium bomb. The one in Nagasaki was a plutonium bomb. Conspiracy theorists will say, they bombed Nagasaki. The Japan, Japanese were going to surrender, but they bombed Nagasaki before they could surrender because they wanted to, to compare the difference between the two types of bombs. Um, I personally don't buy into that, but it is, it is a theory that's out there that you know, is, is something to think about. I only have two minutes left on my lecture, so instead of talking about... Um, Instead of talking about radiometric dating, I'm going to end by just talking a little bit about responsibility of a scientist. You know, whether you're going into medicine or dentistry, you are going to be the most scientific literate person in your, in your area. And it's always important to remember that we have responsibilities. The people who worked on the Manhattan Project, the Manhattan Project was the project um, led by Oppenheimer where they developed the, the nuclear bombs. They did so because they thought it was necessary. The Germans, you know, even at the beginning of the World War, the scientists were scientists. They weren't political. They weren't worried about bombs and stuff. And, and then the American scientists noticed that the Germans all of a sudden stopped communicating about their nuclear physics research. And the Americans realized there's a lot of energy available in nuclear reactions, and they might be developing a bomb. And so the American scientists got very concerned. They wrote a letter. They had Albert Einstein sign it because of his prestige saying, you know, we believe the Germans are building a bomb that has the potential to be more devastating than anything we've ever seen. And so the president um, set up a research lab to develop a bomb. And they got all of the preeminent scientists who had made their way to America out there to work on this bomb. And they, you know, you can listen to interviews. They thought that they were doing the right thing, that this was the only way to save the world. Well, when the bombs were actually detonated and they saw just the devastation they had brought, they most of them felt very, very bad. They felt like they had done something evil. And they hadn't thought about it as evil. They thought about it as saving the world, but they had just released so much bad 
that they they felt they'd done a terrible thing. Now, very quickly, people realized we could make an even stronger bomb if we used fusion because there's so much more energy available from fusion than there is from fission. And so the government tried to reconvene people. They tried to get Oppenheimer to come back and lead the nuclear fusion bomb, what we now call a hydrogen bomb um, or atomic bomb. And, and Oppenheimer, J. Robert Oppenheimer, he said, no, no, I have done more evil than I can account for. I need to do good. And so he was, he had always been kind of a communist and he was pretty much ostracized because he wouldn't go back and lead another project to develop a more, a bigger bomb. And so they found another person to lead and, and it only took a few years to develop the fusion bombs, which when we talk about nuclear warheads now, we're usually talking about those fusion bombs because there's so much more potential for damage with the fusion bomb. The sun, by the way, is a controlled fusion reactor. If we could control fusion reactors, we would have the answer to all of our energy problems. You can't create or destroy energy, but you can transfer from one type to another. And just using the top inch of the ocean water around the world would supply the world with energy for hundreds of years. And so there's ongoing research to develop fusion nuclear reactors that are controlled and that can be used to heat water to make um, electricity like we now can use fission reactors. Um, so far, we don't have a solution to that, but it is one of those holy grail things that will change life forever if scientists can figure it out. So with nuclear energy, there's a good and there's a bad. It has the potential to, to change the world for the better, but we have already seen the potential to change the world for the worse. And so we have to think about the ethics involved. And, and not just say, well, it's science. You know, what they do with it isn't my business. We, we have to think about how these things are going to be used. All right. I hope you have a great day.